Well, let's move on to a less depressing topic, climate change. <laughs> I'm just wondering what this couple is talking about in the Arctic uh, sunbathing. <laughs> well, I'm from Oregon, and as you know, it rains a lot in Oregon. So how can you explain Detroit Reservoir without hardly any water in it? This is the boat dock, and there's the water level. So it's not just California that has the drought. We're suffering in Oregon, too. Well, let's look at the number of days in Portland, Oregon, greater than 80 degrees. This is the number of days per year. In 2011, we got about 45 days greater than 80 degrees. 2012, 13, 14, 15, over 90 days greater than 80 degrees. So I thought it was getting hotter out there in Oregon, but this is dramatic. Now I must caution you, this is short, these are short-term data, and we should look at the long-term when talking about climate change. So let's go for the long-term. 2,000 years of record. Carbon dioxide going along hundreds and hundreds of years, and all of a sudden, in recent times, it skyrockets. These are the um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Methane, same thing, going along and recently increases dramatically. The same with nitrous oxide. Carbon dioxide is the most abundant greenhouse gas. We hear a lot about CO2, but the second most abundant one is methane. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. We don't hear much about methane, but large cuts in carbon dioxide alone will not abate climate change. Methane has a much shorter lifespan in the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's about nine years, where carbon dioxide um, may be 100 years in the atmosphere, maybe more. So. Uh, if we think about methane, we have the potential for more rapid reductions for climate change and mitigation. Well, let's talk about methane and ruminants. So what are ruminants? They're animals, they're mammals that acquire nutrients from plants by fermenting them in their specialized stomachs. Then they belch the methane out during this process. Livestock examples are Cattle, sheep, goats, ruminants. Every cow gives off about 100 pounds of methane per year. Well, so let's look at the data on the methane and see how big of a deal it is. Well, the largest human-caused source of methane emissions is ruminant livestock. Number one source. Let's look on the y-axis here. We have carbon equivalents, emissions. And on, on the x-axis, ruminants, natural gas, landfills, biomass, burning, coal, and rice. This uh, can be mitigated by using drier um, cultivation techniques. So these ruminants, mostly cattle, goats, and sheep, the number one source for methane emissions caused by humans. So let's look at those ruminants that are causing that methane em uh, emission situation. In 1960, about 2.4 billion ruminants on the planet. Today, between 3 and 4 billion. Let's take a look at individual food types and see how they contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> on this axis here, we have carbon equivalents, again, per kilogram of food product. Here, we have each of the food types. The ruminants are in red. <clears throat> the non-ruminants are in blue. See how much higher the ruminant animals are in emissions than the non-ruminant animal products? Just look at that for a minute. So on the very right side of the graph are two plant products. These are much lower than even the non-ruminant animal products. So if you're interested in a low greenhouse gas footprint, go for the plant products in your diet. 
So we published that in, in 2014 saying that greenhouse gas emissions from ruminant meat are significant. Reductions could make substantial contributions to climate change mitigation goals and yields important social and environmental co-benefits. So I'm going to come back to this co-benefit uh, thing with social and environmental. We wrote in this article just a couple of lines about policy saying that implementing a tax or emission trading scheme on livestock's greenhouse gas emissions could be an economically sound policy that would modify consumer prices and, cons and affect consumption patterns. Well, the press got a hold of that. The Huffington Post, The Guardian, Forbes. Forbes' headline was, a meat tax. Seriously? But when that article came out, Richard Branson, the owner of Virgin Airlines, saw this graph. I didn't think any celebrity read my scientific papers. And he put out a press release saying that he is not going to eat beef the rest of his life because of the greenhouse gas emissions. He's the owner of, of Virgin Airlines, very concerned. But um, I think that's a very good start for Richard. But if any of you know him, you might want to encourage him to go a little further. <laughs> Have you seen that bumper sticker, Got Water? But dairy also has environmental and climate impacts. They're higher than plants, but lower than meat. This is a poster uh, about the UN urging a global move to meat and dairy-free diets. So I'm interested in preserving all life on Earth. Saving the world? Well, because Earth's climate may be near tipping points to catastrophic change, the need to act is increasingly pressing. Let's take a look at Arctic sea ice down here on the bottom. September 1984, the maximum summer extent of sea ice shown in white in the Arctic. By 2012, the maximum extent of summer sea ice is exactly 50% what it was in 1984. So climate change is accelerating beyond scientific expectations. Deforestation is a major cause of climate change because of the loss of carbon that's stored in the trees. A major reason for tropical deforestation is the clearing of trees for feed, crops, and pastures. So here's the human carnivory related to the forest again. The most carbon in trees is stored in the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and Southeast Asia. Especially in the Amazon, the, there is a lot of clearing of forest for making livestock pastures and for growing feed crops. This is very expensive in terms of greenhouse gases because those trees need to stay there to store the carbon. Let's look at the crops around the world the green ones are used for food. The purple ones are used mostly for livestock feed, sometimes a fuel. So Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, mostly growing their crops to feed themselves, plant-based foods. United States, and especially Europe, most of those crops go to feeding livestock. In the United States alone, livestock feed makes up 67% of all the cropland in the United States, two-thirds. Human food, 25%. Biofuel, 6%. This is a very low efficiency, as you know, in terms of bringing calories from the earth to humans when you pass it through the livestock. Let's look at the earth's land mammals by weight. Each little square is a million tons. The black squares in the middle is the, is the summed weight of all the humans in the world. That's how much we weigh. Well, this is how much all the cattle weigh in the world over here, and all the pigs, and the goats, and the sheep, and the horses. So the wild land mammals are shown in green squares. So they're represented just on the edges here on the green. Elephants get one square. 
So just a couple of centuries ago, this graph would have been reversed, where there are, would be more wild mammals than humans and livestock. So this is a rapid change in planet Earth. Well, let's just look at three time periods on the same theme. On this y-axis here is the estimated global mass. And let's look at the different categories. But focus on this. 1900 is the year yellow, the year 2000 red, and the year 2050 projections in green. So wild land mammals, yellow to red, and there are no projections for 2050. Humans went from this much mass, total weight on planet Earth, to this much and projected to go this high by 2050. Cattle from here to here to here. All livestock from here to here to here. So this matches what we're uh, seeing in that previous map. Human population is expected to go to over 9 billion by 2050. Meat production expected to go over 450 million tons of meat per year. This is a big, big problem here. So uh, environmentally, if we could just get these curves down, especially this one, um, and eat lower on the food chain, it would do wonders for multiple systems. Okay, let's uh, try this livestock counter. My grad student, Chris Wolf, and I, we just made this uh, a couple of weeks ago. These are global livestock numbers, and these are the ruminants. This is real time coming from the internet right now. Cattle, buffalo, goats, and sheep make up this line. Well, I said it was less than 4 billion when I did that research. Now it's over 4 billion ruminants. This is how fast it's changing. The counter is spinning forward. This is like that national debt counter. You've seen those. A billion pigs. Spinning a little slower. That's because there's four different types of livestock here and just one here. Chickens, it's, I can't even count that fast, with 21 billion. These data come from the FAO, and so these are their own numbers, and we uh, made this model to have real-time internet coverage of global livestock numbers. Okay, thanks. Okay, go to the next slide. So when I see those chicken numbers at 22 billion, and then I read in The Guardian, will the worst bird flu, bird flu outbreak in the U.S. history finally make us reconsider factory farming chicken? Something to ponder. All those chickens, I'm just thinking of the potential for these big pandemics that Dr. Greger's predicting. Well, since we did livestock, let's do methane. Okay, let's try the methane counter. So, this, these are our four billion ruminants, the same ticking. And we know that the ruminants give off this methane. So here is the change in methane emissions in metric tons per year. So in every 10 or 12 seconds, we've just ratcheted up by one more ton per year of methane emissions from livestock on planet Earth. Now my hope is that sometime we can recalibrate this model and get this spinning the opposite direction. So go tell your friends on what it, what it takes to get these lower emissions. Okay, thanks. During this hour presentation today, 64,000 livestock are being added to the planet. These are FAO data, 13,000 ruminants, 1,000 pigs, 50,000 chickens. What we're working on now has this little slogan. It's called Beans for Beef. Substituting beans for beef in the American diet can deliver almost half of the U.S. climate change mitigation target for 2020. Now, if people say what I eat doesn't affect climate change, that is nonsense. We currently have this in review at a journal, substituting beans for beef as a contribution to U.S. climate change targets. So let's see how the editors um, react when they see this. 
we continue to ask the questions, what might be the major reasons people might not want to swap beans for beef in their diets? What could be taste preferences, protein worries, old habits? Well, the answer is fear of intestinal gas. <laughs> well, then we ask, what's the bigger fear? Intestinal gas from eating beans or catastrophic climate change? Are you ready for the answer? <laughs> no, I'm not either. But we can go to Dr. Greger again, who wrote, intestinal gas is normal and healthy. And then two gastroenterologists that specialize in intestinal gas wrote, perhaps increased tolerance of flatus would be a better solution. And we have to listen to this because it's written by Drs. Fardy and Sullivan. <laughs> Actually, intestinal gas is typically not much of a problem, as you know, for those who consistently eat beans. Well, in terms of part four, climate change, reducing ruminant livestock populations could globally reduce climate change, significantly mitigating climate change. Part five, back to Oregon. 